This is a 3D animation I made in After Effects. I actually recreated it from the original 3D animation I built and rendered in a dedicated 3D app. And honestly, they look almost identical. What do you think? With this big 3D update in After Effects, I finally see a real use case and a proper motion design workflow for me. And here is how I would approach it. I define the look and animation of a motion graphics element in a 3D program. Then I transfer the animation data to After Effects, where I rebuild the scene with a new parametric 3D meshes. Plus, a new native effect I've literally been dreaming of for years. From there, I can create endless variations without ever going back to the 3D app, at least in the best case scenario. When native 3D first came to After Effects, I saw huge potential. Being able to set up 3D, composite, and use effects all in one place felt like magic. But over time, I realized that creating and navigating 3D was still more fun in a real 3D software. But with this new 3D update in After Effects, I finally see an improved and more seamless workflow between my 3D app, in my case Cinema 4D, and After Effects. In this video, I'm going to show you exactly that and the benefits of using native 3D in After Effects. But let me show you the new 3D features real quick. Still in After Effects beta here, I'll show you how I tested them hands-on, without reading any deep documentation just going by the headlines Adobe mentioned in their update notes. After creating a new composition, I noticed this new icon on top. It opens up the 3D parametric mesh tools, and there is also a reminder to switch to the advanced renderer if you want native 3D to work. When I dragged into the comp preview, I got the simplest of all primitives, a cube. In the properties tab, I could change its size, add bevels, and adjust the material, all fully parametric. The sphere had its own settings, like radius. A plane, of course, is great for a floor. Then I created an environment light. And from Grayscale Gorilla Studio, I sent over one of their HDRI maps into After Effects and dropped it into the timeline. Instantly, it cast a shadow on the plane. Setting it up as a light source lit the scene beautifully. What's really cool is that I could lower the material's roughness directly in the properties panel to better see the HDRI reflections. In the end, I went with another HDRI map that gave me even nicer reflections. While testing, I also found that you can duplicate a mesh layer and switch its object type right in the properties. Super handy. I tried to create a cyclorama by adding a round feathered mask to the plane, but it didn't work. My idea was to have the plane blend seamlessly into a white background solid. So instead, I added a cylinder mesh, turned off the top cap and added a bevel. I also threw simple wiggle expressions on the meshes to bring them to life. One of the newer features I was curious about is applying substance materials directly to objects. So I jumped over to the stock and marketplace, downloaded a free substance file and dragged it into After Effects. You can assign it in the Properties tab. And it opens up extra controls, in this case specific to the cotton material. Right now, you still can't apply regular effects directly to native 3D layers yet. The workaround? Copy the object to a 2D solid using the CC composite effect. Then you can use any effect you like, for example, Colorama. I also tested a few other substance materials, each with its own unique parameters. By adding the 3D channel extract effect on a pre-com 3D scene, you can generate a depth map and use it with the camera lens blur effect. Though personally, I still prefer Frischluft's depth of field plugin. Looks more natural. Anyway, that was a quick rundown of the new 3D features. You can find more details on Adobe's site. Now to my main point. I wanted to explore an idea that could make the workflow between a 3D app and After Effects smoother. For that, I needed to rebuild the same 3D scene with the same look inside After Effects. I originally made it in Cinema 4D and used the same HDRI map from After Effects to light the scene. And I know, a lot of you use Blender, so I'll keep it general enough so you can follow along in your tool of choice. Cinema 4D has an advantage here because of Cineware. It can show the final look, but honestly, it's sluggish. 
and I wanted to avoid constant round tripping between both apps. The scene itself is really simple. Procedurally animated spheres with physics, but gravity turned off. And I kept After Effects limitations in mind. Just basic primitives, no fancy stuff. Next, I needed to get the animation data into After Effects. Yes, you could import animated GLB sequences, but you'll lose flexibility for adjustments later. I tried Cineware first, importing the C4D file as it was, but keyframeless animations don't transfer. Then I baked the animation as an alembic file and added Cineware tags to each object. Import didn't work either. Exporting an AEC file kind of worked, but it didn't include scale animation. The fastest fix was a plugin called NitroBake for Cinema 4D, which bakes all object animations with one click. If you're using C4D and don't want to buy it, there is a well-known Expresso setup called MoGraph to Nulls. Just Google it. It transfers animation data to separate nulls. But in my case, I transferred the animation to cubes instead to better check the sync. Then I baked the animation. This way, Cineware could extract the animation into animated null layers inside After Effects, including position, rotation, and scale keyframes. There is even a Blender plugin that can do the same thing. Pretty neat. Instead of dragging, you can double-click the cube tool to add a cube layer, but I just copied one from the other comp. Then I removed all wiggle expressions, parented it to a null layer, and matched its dimensions to my C4D cube, 200 by 200 by 200, which I rechecked in Cinema 4D, and of course without bevels. After setting the material back to default, I did the same for the remaining 32 cubes. The After Effects sequence stayed in sync, so I knew it matched with Cinema 4D. Then I copied the cyclorama cylinder, environment light and HDRI map into the new comp and adjusted the lighting. Eventually, I changed my mind and extracted the HDRI light from Cinema 4D to better match the original look. At first, half the shadow was missing, so I centered the shadow box in the render options. Then I turned all cubes into spheres, like in my original C4D scene. From there, I started to get a bit creative, turned every second mesh back into a cube, played with the materials and added bevels. No need to go back to C4D for that. To get a better comparison, I adjusted the same objects in Cinema 4D. And that's when I saw the reflections were completely different. So I tweaked the environment light and after effects until they got closer. The sphere reflections were a good reference. Even when the reflections matched, C4D still looked brighter. Turns out, 3D meshes and After Effects don't show up in reflections, just the HDRI map. So I had to cheat in Cinema 4D by hiding the primitives and cyclorama from the reflections, just to make it look closer to the After Effects scene. Still, some frames didn't match. C4D kept looking brighter. Luckily, it's possible to fix that in After Effects through compositing. I duplicated the comp, turned off the floor to isolate the objects, and placed both subcomps into a new one. When I toggled the top layer on and off, I saw that removing the background mesh alone brightened up the reflections, since it no longer cast shadows. Using the curves effect, I brightened the objects. When both versions looked similar, I rendered the C4D sequence. Side by side, you could see small differences, but honestly, I preferred the After Effects version, especially the background lighting. So this time, I had to tweak the Cinema 4D render. Because I forgot to render an object ID pass, the isolated After Effects meshes as an alpha mat came in handy. I could edit the background separately. I liked C4D's reddish tone more. So I added a hue and saturation effect to shift the After Effects colors a bit. But compared to C4D, the shadow still felt weak. So I duplicated the main comp, selected all 3D objects, cranked emission intensity up to 100% and boosted the lighting until the floor and the objects were almost pure white. That made the shadows pop, exactly what I wanted. I dropped the shadow comp between the geometry and background comps, masked out the top part, it wasn't pure white anyway. 
Then I looked for an effect I've been waiting for to finally become a native effect. Unmalt. I always used Red Giant's Unmalt before, because the built-in preset only worked for certain situations. Now that it's native, I applied it to the shadow comp, set the background color to white, and boom, shadows isolated. The shadows looked stronger, but still lacked some of the richness compared to Cinema 4D's render. Then I realized the cyclorama floor wasn't close enough to the objects. After moving it closer, without intersecting the meshes, everything looked way better. A few more tweaks later, and I had an almost perfect match between both renders. Except for one thing. C4D's shadows leaned a bit red, probably because of global illumination. I wanted them for the After Effects render as well. With isolated shadows, I could just tint them slightly red. Lastly, since the After Effects meshes still looked a bit grainy, I went into the render settings and increased shadow smoothness and render quality. Perfect. Now that I'd matched the look, I could use this base scene as a starting point to create different variations. For example, I added an expression that linked the emission intensity to the scale of one of the objects. With Draft 3D turned on, which hides the shadows in preview, I could not only play it back almost in real time, but also interactively move the camera around. After extracting the depth map to use for the depth of field effect, it looked like this. But what if you wanted a slow motion version of the same animation? In a 3D app, you'd have to re-render everything. Here, no problem, just change the composition's duration. In my case, I doubled it, and it instantly gave me a smooth slow motion look. Same idea for the next variation. This time, I changed the emission color and linked the object scale both to the depth of field and the camera's Z position. I can think of a lot of possibilities here for those of you who create templates. You no longer have to rely on pre-rendered 3D scenes. You could even let users customize the 3D meshes themselves through sliders. So, for motion designers building animated 3D packages like broadcast designs or design systems that need multiple variations, this could be a solid workflow. Imagine needing a 9 to 16 version with different 3D objects and colors like this one. You can now do it all directly inside After Effects. No need to go back to your 3D app. And that's it, guys. I still see huge potential here, and it's clearly heading in the right direction. But yeah, I've got a little wish list, like being able to use animated textures, or a comp as a texture, or more parametric meshes, like an octahedron maybe? or motion graphics ready stuff like a 3D lower third where you can control predefined animations with a simple slider. And how about that? Modifiers, bending, twisting meshes, things you could just drop on as effects. Just a few ideas that popped into my head would be nice. See you next time.